Okay, we are in Explore the Bible, the book of First and Second Thessalonians. This is session number three. Session number three is titled Confronted. And we're First Thessalonians chapter two, verses thirteen to twenty. So session number three, confronted, first Thessalonians chapter two, verses thirteen through twenty. So kind of to set the stage again, let's look at what we've looked at so far in the book. Uh, this is probably one of the oldest, if not the oldest, of the Pauline epistles. Uh, it was written around 51, 52 A.D. by the Apostle Paul. And if you'll notice in verse 1 of chapter 1, it's Paul, Silas, and Timothy. But when you read the letter itself, the predominant author is Paul, but the other two, part of his missionary team, were basically co-authors uh, providing input, if you will, to the letter because they were part of the group that founded the church in Thessalonica. And again, remember back in Acts, Paul founded the church in Thessalonica after having been expelled from the city of Philippi and was only able to stay there for three weeks before he was expelled from Thessalonica. The same folks who caused him problems in Philippi followed him to Thessalonica and then would eventually follow him to Berea and cause problems there. And eventually Paul would end up in the southern part of what is now modern day Greece in Athens and then eventually in Corinth where he would actually write the letter to 1 first, uh, first Thessalonians to the church at Thessalonica. Having sent Timothy back to check on what was going on, this is in response to Timothy's trip and Timothy's report to him. Um, first chapter of uh, First Thessalonians is basically Paul's uh, greeting and recognition of who wrote the letter, who it's for, and then a prayer of thanksgiving, which kind of becomes important in today's session. Normal way that a letter was written then was the first part of the letter would be, here's who wrote it, here's who is to receive it, and then a prayer of thanksgiving or a greeting of some type to the recipients, which is what we find in chapter 1. Last week, we looked at the beginning of chapter 2, where Paul kind of reminisces about his time in Thessalonica and talks about how the church there received his gospel message and also the foundation of the relationship between them and Paul and his missionary team, which he viewed as a family relationship. And if you remember last week, he talks a lot about uh, treating them like a mother would treat a nursing child, treating them like a father would treat a child who he was training up. Uh, so Paul viewed the churches as a family relationship. And then as we get to the latter part of chapter 2, he again has a prayer of thanksgiving, which begins with verse 13, which is where we're going to pick up today. Uh, kind of unusual. Most of his letters only have the thanksgiving at the beginning. But when you look in 1 Thessalonians, there are several places where he expresses thanksgiving for something about the church in Thessalonica. So as we get started, I have a question for you. How do you deal with change? <laughs> Other than everybody just grimaced and laughed. How do you deal with change? Prayer. Prayer? Okay. Look for the positive that's going to come as a result of the change. Okay. Look for the positive that's going to come as a result of the change. Which says to me that maybe the change wasn't exactly what you wanted. Perhaps. Perhaps. Do we have a tendency to view change as negative? I see a few heads nodding yes. It's not always negative. You know, sometimes change can be positive. But you have to consider the alternative. Yeah. But you have to consider the alternative. Maybe the alternative is worse than the change. I think the first response is to grimace because I don't want it to change. Yeah. And then when I become rational, 
I realized that it's something that's going to happen and we accept it okay. and move forward and decide that it was, you know, they just changed my cable company. <laughs> The first response may I be a like grimace. I now that I'm into it, you know, but yeah. it, I didn't want to do it. We don't, oh, we kind of like the status quo, right? Yeah. We like things to get along the way they've always got along. Well, some of the things that Paul had to address, particularly in the churches in Macedonia and Achaia, when he established them, was it created a lot of change for the people there. Because remember, this is a predominantly Gentile area, which meant they worshipped either Greek or Roman gods, or they worshipped some other pantheon of gods. And now they're making a switch to worshipping a single god, which the Jews did, but they're worshipping a god who has sent the Messiah, which the Jews did not accept, so that's a change for any Jew that became a Christian. It was even more of a change for the Gentiles because they went from a multitude of gods to one God. And that made all the difference in the world in family relationships, in work relationships, in the relationships in the marketplace, and wherever else they would be. And in... The latter part of chapter 2, in mine, it's the Holman version, it's titled Reception and Opposition to the Message. Some of the people who heard the message said, or grimaced, as Beverly said a minute ago, when they're looking at the change, they grimaced and said, not for me, I like the status quo. And some said, not for me, I like the status quo, and I don't want you to listen to this. The church, though, accepted it readily. So we're going to look at Paul's uh, encouragement for the church and his desire to see them. So we're going to start with verses 13 and 14 of second chapter of First Thessalonians. So First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. Okay. Um, Frida, would you read those two verses, please? 13, 14, is yours NIV or what? NIV. Okay, 13, 14, please. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of man, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. For you, brothers, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own countrymen, same things those churches suffered from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displeased God and are hostile to all men in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. I have read more than you wanted me to. Oh, that's okay. Um... Starting at verse 13, in the Holman it says, also. Also is kind of referring back to what he's just talked about. In the first part of chapter 2, he's been talking about his relationship with the church, with the people there. And if you remember last week, one of the things that Paul pointed out was, I didn't just come and preach to you. I became part of your family. I became part of the community. I became part of the assembly, the church here. So I didn't just come as an outsider. I wasn't a visiting evangelist. I became your pastor for the short period of time I was there. I became part of your community. So the also is looking back. The also is also looking forward to what he's about to say to them. Because what he's going to say to them is based on becoming part of the community. So also, this is why we constantly thank God. And New International says, I think, without ceasing. Thank God without ceasing. Um, it doesn't mean that he continually prayed for it. The sermon this morning talked about the latter part of the verse. One of the uh, 
characteristics of the vibrant church was to pray constantly or pray without ceasing. It simply means that you have a prayer list, that you pray for the church or you pray for a group of people. And if you remember when we looked at Romans, when we looked at Philippians, we looked at Colossians, every letter that Paul writes, usually in his greeting, he talks about how I pray constantly for the church. Paul not only established the churches, he also prayed for them, built them up, encouraged them to move forward in their faith. So this is why we constantly thank God because you're part of my family. Because when you received the message about God that you heard from us, you welcomed it not as a human message, but as it truly is the message of God. Okay? The word in the Holman, and I think it tracks in the New International as well, it talks about the message from God and the human message, or I think the New International says the word of God and a human word. But the word translated as word or message, or in some translations it'll actually say teachings, is all the same word. It's all the same Greek word whether it's translated as word, teaching, message, whatever, where Paul makes the distinction is where that word, message, teaching came from. So notice in verse 13, it was a message, word, teaching from God or a human message, word, or teaching. Again, the people of this time had all kinds of philosophies, had all kinds of gods that they worshipped. They had people who taught different philosophies. So, uh, Gnosticism, uh, Cynicism, I don't know. They had, uh, quarterly gave a listing of different uh, philosophies that were being put out at this time. Those were all human-made messages. Paul's making a distinction here. The message I brought to you was not from me. I'm not the teacher here who's telling you my philosophy of life. I'm telling you God's philosophy of life. I'm telling you what God is saying to you, not what I'm saying to you. And he's constantly thanking God. Remember I said his thanksgiving is usually at the beginning? Notice he's doing it again. I thank God because you recognized that this was a message from God not from me. And you received it as such. And not only did you receive it, but you're growing in it. Look at the end of verse 13, which also works effectively in you believers. Their lives were being transformed. Remember previously I mentioned what a change it would be for these people because they were used to worshiping multiple gods and now they're worshiping one and it affects their family relationship it affects their work relationships it affects every relationship they have because their community for the most part worship multiple gods so it would be a major change for them but paul is in prayer for them because they have made that change their behavior reflects their acceptance of God's message. And then in verse 14 it says, For you brothers, remember brothers here means brothers and sisters. NIV, in fact, I think says brothers and sisters. So it's just meaning you, the assembly, you, the church, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Now, remember Paul in several of his letters talks about you need to become imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. Well, now he's saying they are imitators of God's churches in Judea. But maybe not for the reason they want to be. Because again, it says, since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. And again, I remind you the word since here really means because. Um, the churches in Judea were persecuted. The people who followed Paul 
from Philippi to Thessalonica to Berea are still there in Thessalonica. They're still opposing the church. They're still causing problems for these people uh, because um, they're making a change. These are the ones who said, I heard what you said. I don't like what you said. I'm going to stop you from even talking to people about it. That's what the church there faced. And from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. And you've got to remember, what nationality or what ethnic group is the church in Judea? Somebody just said it. Jewish. Jewish. It's predominantly Jewish. So when he says they suffered the same things from people of your country just as they did from the Jews, he's not talking about Jews in general. He's talking about the political religious leaders in Judea who were persecuting what was predominantly a Jewish church. In this case, it was you know, unknown Jews or Gentiles that were following Paul, but they were doing the same thing. They were persecuting the Gentile slash Jewish church that was in Greece. And then he goes on to say, how did they persecute? Well, they killed the Lord Jesus, again, referring to the political religious leaders. The prophets, so this wasn't the first time, it goes back to the history of the Jewish nation, and persecuted us. Now, us here means not only Paul, but also the churches there in, Ju in Judea. But notice their persecution... They displease God and are hostile to everyone. Um, they just didn't like the church in general. It was making a status change. Now, what kind of status change was occurring? Well, there are a couple of things that they could not have liked. For the Jews, probably they did not like the fact that um, Paul was preaching Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Because the religious leaders didn't accept that. So there was a theological reason for the Jews, religious political leaders, to oppose the message that was being said. There was also a social reason for it. Because if the Jews accepted this, and the Gentiles accepted this, then Paul was preaching they became... Doug? Yeah, together. They became together. Yeah, one. And, and can you say that was not acceptable? Right. To the religious leaders? That was socially unacceptable. So they were upending the social network if you brought these two together. Exactly. And then for the Gentiles, the Greek and Roman God worshipers, it upset them because their communities worship multiple gods. So there are all kinds of chains coming in here that people were opposing because they didn't want to change the status quo. James? Yeah. <clears throat> that, it's kind of a little bit off subject, but think about in the 1830s when the Mormon church started mm -hmm. and how we in this state treated them. Now, I don't agree with them. Don't get me wrong. But so they would teach this lesson about how bad we were in this country the way we treated them because they claim they believe in the same God that we do I, I don't know anyway I just that went through my crazy mind yeah. they looked at us but, as being the oppressors because they had a new revelation right. from God right. now granted and mainstream Christianity views them as a cult Right, I, but, and I certainly agree with that. And it was a doctor and a demon. I'm sorry? Paul would call it a doctor and a demon. Yeah, I, I think Paul would say this is uh, this mean, is the message of man, than, not the yeah. message of God, as he yeah. said here at the beginning. Right. But we won't get into that. No, I'm, I'm That's sorry. a total different subject for later. I'm sorry I brought it up. No, it's, no. It no. through my mind. You, you made a point. I mean, <laughs> it's true. It's true, yeah. But uh, well, I think the point is... How do we treat people we disagree with? Right. Yeah. And today, people we disagree with. Well, if, if you want to bring you. that back to today, you know, how do we treat other Christians who are not of our nationality, 
our ethnicity, our community. We don't always treat them the best even when they are supposedly our brothers and sisters in Christ. That's personal opinion, okay? We'll leave it with that. But just think of how we treat others who have the same religious beliefs that we do but don't look, sound, act like we do. We don't always accept them. Exactly. Okay, going on to 16. Uh, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. We don't know how they hindered, but hindered us from speaking to the Gentiles. Again, what did the Jews view themselves religiously? They were the children of God. They were the chosen of God. So again, socially upsetting. If Gentiles believed and Jews believed, they became, supposedly, became one. They became a family, an assembly of Christian believers. But the Jews were God's chosen people. How does this work? So the Jews hindered, didn't want to have the Gentiles spoken to. As a result, they are always adding to the number of their sins and wrath has overtaken them completely again he's not talking about the Jews in general um, history tells us that Paul's writings in this area in different places have been used to promote anti-semitism the idea that the Jews were responsible for Christ's death therefore they are bad people as a group that's not what Paul's saying here when he says the Jews he's talking about the political religious leaders who didn't want their power structure upset it upset and even the Jews in Judea who formed the first churches were persecuted by fellow Jews just like the church in Thessalonica was persecuted by their fellow countrymen their fellow community members, their fellow workers in the guild, because they were upsetting the status quo. They were upsetting the power structure of the day. So Paul was not anti-Jewish. He was Jewish. He was anti the leadership who was fighting against Christianity. Any, just like he was. Yeah, just like he was. Yeah. Before he any was comment or response to that from anybody? <laughs> okay. Um, let's look at seventeen through twenty, and we'll finish the chapter. Uh, Francis, you have King James, right? Yes. Would you do seventeen to twenty, please? That we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence not in heart, endeavored the Lord abundantly to see your faith, face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Okay. He's just been talking about the opposition that the church in Thessalonica faces. He's talked about the opposition he faced, the churches in Judea faced. But, here's the contrast. But for us, brothers, us, Paul, his missionary team, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, remember he was only there for three weeks before him and his team were thrown out, we were forced to leave you in person, physically, but you never left our hearts. Go back to several previous verses. He continually prays for the church, so they're not out of his mind. It's not out of sight, out of mind. They're in his mind. He is praying for them. 
We were forced to leave you for a short time in person, not in heart. We greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. The desire was there. The ability to do it was not. Why? Was he in prison at the time? No. Nope. Nope. It's, it's kind of a trick question. We don't know why. It just says Satan hindered me. He wouldn't let me come. We don't know why. Something stopped us from coming. He wasn't in prison. He was, in fact, in Corinth at this time with a very successful ministry in Corinth. He was in Corinth for like 18 months. So he was there doing ministry and things were going really well. But he never was able to go back at this point to Thessalonica. Yeah. What about, what about the fear? Okay. You're, you're close, I think. Because if you remember back in Acts, they had to set a bond. Jason and his household were brought up before the magistrates, and they had to set a bond to release them before Paul left. So, fear not, I don't think, for Paul, but I think fear of Paul for what might happen to the ones who had set his bond. Because we don't know what the bond was. It didn't say if it was money. It didn't say if it was he could never come back. We don't know. But something kept him from coming back. And some of the commentaries refer back to the bond that had to be set for him to release Jason in the community there. That's a good point. In our quarterlies, it's going back to Something about the, the three missionaries had been separated from the Thessalonians. I think, I think that just means they went away. Mm -hmm. But it says the Greek wording indicates something being violently torn away, abandoned, or even orphaned. Yeah. And I've never taken it in that context. Yeah. So the, it's kind of like they were really ripped away and thrown out. And well, it really discarded. It, and all you, that. you think yeah. about what happened when they left. Uh, they couldn't find Paul, so they took Jason and his household, and they had to set a bond to get right. free. And then Paul left basically that night to free them up. Right. So yeah, they, they it was a violent leap. Same thing like in, in Berea. He had to leave at night there because they followed him. Violent separation. Yeah. And, and the word is translated as orphan. So it means not only, it can also be read as the person being orphaned or somebody... Which side it is being orphaned, it could be both sides. So the church was orphaned and Paul was orphaned because he was no longer with the church. Does that make sense? So they were torn apart. And we don't know why they were hindered. He could have been sick. It could have been because the ministry was so fruitful in Corinth he couldn't leave it. But I don't think, personally, I don't think he would have worded it quite this way. He says, Satan hindered me. So it wasn't, I don't think, that they were doing so well in Corinth that he couldn't leave. But something was blocking him going back. Now, the good news is later, in one of his later missionary journeys, he does get back. But not at this time. Verse 19. This is his proof, if you will, that he really wanted to come back to him. Because he starts off with a rhetorical question in 19. For who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Now, for us, I think most people take boasting negatively. If somebody is called boastful, yeah, Bert's over here giving me kind of... <laughs> well, yeah. It's kind of a negative word, right? Yeah. But the word they're really talking about here is justifiable pride. And when he talks about the crown, he's talking about that um, wreath that they would give athletic victors or generals who won battles, showing that they did something great. They achieved something really spectacular. 
And so basically what Paul is saying is I can be justifiably proud of you guys in the church because of what you have done in the face of opposition. And when I stand before my Lord and present what I have done, your exhibition or exhibit one, that I was successful in spreading the gospel because of what transformed your lives. And then in verse 20, he says, for you, you aren't just a byproduct of me preaching. You are the reason that I went to preach. You are my glory. You are my joy. You are the reason I can justifiably boast about what has happened. <clears throat> and when I stand before God and he asks, what have you done? I can look to him and say, look at the church in Thessalonica. This is the result of what I have done. Not because the church was perfect. There isn't a church in the world that is perfect. What did Pastor, I think it was this morning, I sometimes get his sermons turned around, but what, what did he say this morning about uh, the church not being perfect? He made a comment at the beginning of the sermon about relationships and how relationships can never be perfect because people aren't perfect. Well, there's no church that is ever going to be perfect until that church is gathered together in heaven. Until then, we're imperfect people and we're going to have imperfections. Amen. But what Paul, I think, is saying here, and it kind of follows up on Pastor Jim's sermon this morning, it's just like he encouraged the church in Thessalonica. And just as Pastor Jim said this morning, a vibrant, growing church encourages its membership. And encourage means you come along the side, you comfort in times of grief, you rejoice in times of good tidings, and you, go to, you grow together. And I think that's what Paul is saying here as he ends up chapter 2. As I'm encouraged because of what you guys have done in transforming your lives when you accepted God's message through me as the messenger. Okay, well, I think that finishes chapter two. So next week we'll pick up and we look at chapter three. Anybody have anything they'd like to add or something that I missed? Well, you didn't miss it, but I like how it puts in there that this isn't, you know, how people were trying to say that about the word being being by men. And he was, no, this isn't by men, this is by God. Mm -hmm. And that's how some people try to say it today. It said the Bible was written by men. And it wasn't. It was inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. It was just pinned by men. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, uh, I've had struggles telling people about the Bible. He said, well, that was written by a man. Well, no, no, it wasn't. It was in, it was pinned by a man, but it was inspired by God and mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. You know, I think that makes a big difference. In it. And every bit of it is the truth. Okay. Anybody else? John Dameron has a picture of his granddaughter of joyful boasting. She <laughs> bought a four pound bass yesterday. <laughs> Justifiable boasting. Just Bill's farm. At Bill's farm. And I told her I told him so she ought to be on prices right, right the way she was displaying it. She was know? displaying it. Huh? She was the oh she was displaying it. With a big smile. Oh she was. Yes. That's a good sized fish. Yeah, that was. That was nice of you. Very small pond. Thank God for that Well, hopefully you get a lot more rain this year. Remember when you pond said, oh, there ain't no fish in that pond. <laughs> okay. Let's close in prayer. Babe. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the call to be encouragers for other believers. We thank you for the transforming power of your word in our lives. And we pray that you would help us to encourage other believers in their walk and in their 
uh, growth as we go through this life. Thank you for the example that Paul and his team uh, put before the church at Thessalonica and also put before us of what it means to persevere in the face of opposition, in the face of trials, and help us to continually move forward as we seek to be light and salt in this world. For we ask it in your name. Amen. Amen.